Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Arvind Manosha, President and CEO of Wolf Trap Foundation for the Performing Arts. Arvind has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Arvind, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Wolf Trap, everybody knows Wolf Trap, everybody loves Wolf Trap. Talk about Wolf Trap and also what led you to this position so many years ago and, and, and the leadership that you've been exercising since? Well, uh, Wolf Trap is, uh, like many of the great organizations in our country, a very unique place, has a unique history. Uh, but probably the most uh, defining characteristic of Wolf Trap is that we operate and program the nation's only national park for the performing arts. And that was a, a kind of a remarkable story of philanthropy and civic duty and a visionary founder who donated land uh, and uh, the Congress of the United States accepted it under the condition of making it uh, a permanently protected green space for the ever urbanizing Metro DC area. And what we've now come to 45 years later is a wonderful national park with it is specifically created to celebrate the performing arts. We have three performance spaces within our kind of larger footprint. Uh, we welcome about a half million people a year through the gates. And um, you know what comes from that is not only a celebration of the arts through performances, but also a dedication to cultivating the next generation using the arts to help young children be better at whatever they're doing. Talk about the physical footprint and talk about how do you manage the operations and, and retain all the skills that are required to maintain part park, part performing arts center? Well, one of the, um, the great um, aspects of Wolf Trap and really what embodies um, its whole foundation is that we are uh, in close partnership with the National Park Service. Uh, the National Park Service operates the park and, and maintains all of the, the grandeur and the beauty. And of course, that is absolutely not only their expertise, but their passion. I think it's worth noting, um, you know, the National Park Service are really the stewards of the fabric of American culture. That is really what the Park Service does. And they do that in a number of different ways. Uh, they maintain the great parks of the West, as we all know, the great vistas and, and landscapes. They also maintain the National Historic Registry all of the monuments across our country, um, the artifacts of the native people. These are all building blocks of Americana. And in operating uh, the National Park for the Performing Arts and in the act of creating it, the message there is that creativity and the performing arts are also part of the fabric of American culture, just like the other aspects of the National Park Service's remit. Uh, so we feel very fortunate not only to have not that stamp, but the partnership that comes with working with the Park Service and really their, the enthusiasm in which they bring to managing and maintaining the operations of the park. So let's talk about the artistic side. And, and you present quite a range of art. You know, my programming staff and I think about diversity and inclusion every day. We're thinking about the fact that our national park partner is really uh, an emblematic um, outgrowth of the people. We are owned by our community by definition. We should have programs that reflect society. Um, that is a goal that is never achieved fully. It's always one that we're striving towards. It changes, it evolves. But, uh, you know, we have rock, we have pop, we have R&B, we've got new acts and older acts. We've got the National Symphony Summer Residency as well as our own opera company that produces original work all summer long. Um, I think that when people look at the Wolf Trap calendar, um, they really see the full gamut of the performing arts. So it's art as public service. It's, it's the idea of we are serving not an interest, we're serving as many interests as possible. We're serving America writ large. Absolutely. And as you, and, and you'll, never, you'll never achieve the perfect balance because America is constantly changing. Absolutely. I mean, that makes it, you know, that, that's part of what makes this so thrilling is, as you say, it's a public service. Uh, the public always changes and evolves. It's a very dynamic concept of who are your public. Um, it keeps us on our toes and I think makes it important for us to really think about how we are responding to the changes of society around us. How do you know that you're being successful? So many arts organizations, particularly when it comes to the classic arts, mm -hmm. opera, for example, you mentioned, um, find real challenges in engaging younger audiences. Mm -hmm. 
how do you go through the process of measuring um, what audiences are being engaged and, and how different audiences receive the, the experience? Um, we do a combination of, uh, I think, what a lot of people try to do. There's some quantitative measures that we can easily look at and metrics that we can um, note and, and, and take note of. There are also qualitative measures, you know, what we see in the theater, what we hear from the people nearest to us, what we hear from social media and other places like that. Um, you know, we look at things like, for example, um, we're always looking at the ticket buyers for a particular show and seeing how many people have never bought a ticket before. Mm -hmm. You know, how many people are engaging with us for the very first time. Um, and that can mean, um, that has great implications. You know, we'd like to make the parks more diverse. We always like to have new audiences come to our presentations. As we venture out into um, presentations or art forms that we may not have a long tradition with, but we're starting a new tradition, I like to see, when I look at the ticket manifest, you know, how many of these people just have never touched our ticketing system before or our development program before. We've had concerts where that might be 60, 70, and in one case, close to 90%. You know, these were clearly people that had never come to Wolf Trap. And I, I talked to some of these folks who will say, you know, I've lived in the area for 15 years, and this was the first time I came, and I think I, I can and learn from And you touched that. a nerve. You, well, yeah. you programmed in order to achieve that result. That is... So th th there's an intention behind this. This uh, having 80, 90 percent of of first time ticket buyers is not a coincidence. No. that is a that is a team effort. A hundred percent, and it's also something that um, you know I have to say I I believe that those of us in the um, field of arts administration have to have conviction and patience because it doesn't always work the first time out. And you know, throughout my career, I've heard people have that same fear, which is, well, we would like to be more diverse in this way, whatever way that may be defined. And we programmed this concert, and it wasn't very successful, so we can't do that again. And I think, well, if you're committed, if you actually have a belief that you are, have a responsibility to connect with an audience that you're not currently attracting, you have to think of the long game. You have to think about how to develop that audience, how to develop a relationship, how to have an authentic presence, Think about what goes on your stage, but also how you tell your story, where you're telling your story. These things don't always click the very first time out the gate. And uh, we've had success in many ways, and we've also had some learning experiences where we've taken that experience and thought, okay, the next time we go after, uh, we're going to do it better. We're going to do it differently. We're going to tweak our approach. And uh, it is a multi-year uh, program. These are not questions about diversity and inclusivity are not questions that are easily answered and I think are not questions. Are never, they're never finally answered either. Well, they're never finally answered, absolutely. Um, but we should, um, we should approach them not with um, a superficial commitment. We should approach them with a commitment that we're willing to slog it out for the long term in order to achieve the results that we're hoping for. Talk a little bit about the extension, uh, the, the extent of your education program and your public programming and how that, that uh, takes advantage of what is actually happening on stage. You know, our education programs really run the gamut. Uh, we have programs for all ages, but you know, there's two areas where I think we really have focused our efforts. Um, in one area, it's much, very much connected to what's going on on stage and thinking about um, our commitment to the training of the very best young opera singers. Uh, it was really something that was very important to our founder from the very beginning. And if you look at the Wolf Trap Opera over these last three to four decades, so many of the greatest singers of our time have come and spent a couple of years at Wolf Trap. Um, we really try to make it the first professional experience of their lives after they leave the training part of their young careers and are launching their international, uh, in many cases, stardoms. Uh, they spend a little bit of time with us. And I think that um, that commitment to the training of the, of the artist speaks very centrally to our founder's original vision for her park and the creation of the National Park for the Arts. The other part of it, though, is um, a very large program, probably the largest component of our education department, which is a program in early childhood education. It's our uh, Wolf Trap Institute for Early Learning Through the Arts. And it stems from a, a very foundational belief that two things, that a child's development between the ages of birth and six really is 
the building blocks for all future successes. The amount of brain activity and the synapse development that happens at that age, it's very hard to come back from that. Um, we also believe that the arts are a particularly effective way to reach children at that age, because children at that age like to be, to do, to embody, to be active. We work with um, children all across the country, mostly in communities where they're economically disadvantaged. We find the children often are not necessarily receiving the appropriate amount of stimulation and access to education. When they get to first grade, they're at risk of not being at standard. Our goal is to use the arts to level the playing field, to give every young child an equal opportunity to get into first grade and start the rest of their educational career. Uh, and many studies have taught us over the years, including our most recent with the Federal Department of Education, that our programs in using the arts have demonstrable effect on the children's brain development. And we've recently launched a STEM program through the arts where we are teaching young children math and science concepts using music and dance. And just to give you an example, um, in our most recent study, we found that the children who went through our math program in a given preschool or kindergarten received the equivalent of an additional 35 days of learning within their school year. So if you're an administrator in a community where you may not have endless amounts of money for professional development or new courses for your teachers, and we're telling you that within the same school year, if you use our approach, your kids will receive an additional 35 days of math instruction. It's a very attractive proposition. And you talk to the teachers and the parents who've had their children go through the program, and you get an instant kind of feedback loop of people who feel very um, fortunate to be able to be participant in a Wolf Trap STEM program. And it's kind of a, you know, it's something I talk to folks and say, oh, we have a STEM program for four-year-olds using music. You know, sometimes you need to peel the onion a little bit to understand how that works, but once you make those connections between motion, movement, patterns, mathematics, music, it all becomes much clearer, and the brains at that point in a, children, in a child's life is just like a sponge. You know, if you can get them interested in learning, you can teach them anything. This is, it, it is so wonderful to hear about the work that you're doing at Wolf Trap. Ara Minosha, the Wolf Trap Foundation for the Performing Arts, thank you so much for sharing the work of this amazing gift to the American people and of the American people. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for having me.